a new session of our Data Science and Statistics webinar. Today featuring Alipio George, our speaker. Alipio is Associate Professor at the Department of Computer Science of the Faculty of Science of University of Porto, where he's head of department already for uh, two and a half years. He is also the coordinator of the laboratory in artificial intelligence and decision support of Ineshtek. Uh, he has, of course, led many projects on information extraction, machine learning, data mining, web intelligence, and the like, co-chaired several international conferences, and has been vice president of the Portuguese Association for Artificial Intelligence. Today, Alipu will tell us about narrative extraction from text. And Alipu, the e floor is yours. Welcome. <laughs> So hello everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you very mu uh, much, Paula, for the, the kind uh, introduction. Um, so as Paula said, my name is Alipio George. I'm from the Faculty of Science and also from Inesc Tech. Um, and I'm uh, here to talk about uh, narrative extraction from text, um, which is under the, the logo of Text to Story, which is the name of a project and also the name of uh, a series of workshops. So I would say that currently this is uh, my grand challenge and I'm doing this with uh, a good number of people who are involved in the, in the project and not, not only. Um, and uh, the project is being um, um, co-directed uh, co by myself and uh, Ricardo Cantor. So um, let me just, okay. So the team is, is quite large now. Um, we have uh, PhD um, researchers, uh, PhD students, master students, uh, colleagues from the Faculty of, uh, of Engineering, from the Faculty of uh, Economics, from the Faculty of, of Arts. So it's, uh, it's a very um, interesting team with people from a computational background, um, uh, like myself. Uh, and people from um, a linguistics background, uh, which are uh, an important part of, of, our, of our project. So in, in, in particular, they come from the Centro de Linguística da, da Universidade do Porto. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, organized a number of workshops, Text to Story. Uh, this year, we will have Text to Story 2021, which is already the fourth, if, uh, if I'm not, uh, wrong um, to be organized in this line. We are currently accepting papers. It, it is traditionally organized with the European Conference on uh, Information Retrieval. And this year, um, we also had uh, AI for Narratives workshop at HKI 2020, which was this year in January 2021 because of the, the, the pandemic situation. Um, and we've had uh, uh, very interesting uh, dynamics with the community devoted to narrative extraction from text and not only, um, and people who have been looking at this uh, general topic uh, from different perspectives, which, is, which has been very um, um, enriching and, and uh, very, um, very interesting. Uh, we also uh, had a special issue on information processing and management. So I'm going to talk about, uh, to give an overview of narrative extraction. What is narrative extraction? Um, the pipeline that we uh, consider, and then the, the steps pre-processing, the general steps for pre-processing and natural language processing, and then some more specific things, extracting narrative elements, representing narratives, displaying narratives, and the uh, challenges and future work. So, a narrative is basically um, a recount of something that happened, of a story. So, for example, we, if we see the text, the king died in a battle, the queen married his brother. So this tells us a story with our knowledge and our, our um, um, tools for uh, understanding what is said here. We can... Um, identify events, we can identify characters, we can relate events uh, in time, we can see a causal uh, relation between events. For example, we know that the king died in a battle, so we have the event battle and the, the death of the king. The queen married his brother, 
we know that uh, we assume that this happened after the, the death of the king. Um, and we can see that there is some, some logical structure behind this text. So our uh, aim here in general is to uh, let machines do uh, similar um, understanding tasks with this kind of, of text. So a story basically is a sequence of related events. Uh, so it's something that happened, um, a sequence of things that happen and have some uh, logical uh, structure, some coherence. A narrative is the act of telling the story. It could be in text, could be in video, could be in the film. Um, different representations can be used. We are looking specifically at uh, narratives told in text um, and uh, um, that can later be converted to other uh, ways of representation. So a story, as I said, is a set of related events. They can be related temporally. One uh, event happens after the other or at the same time or during um, the other event. So there's a chronological relation. There's a spatial dimension. There's a causal relation between many of these events. In a story, there's usually a common subject, there's a coherence, so the events are always related to each other. Otherwise, we would have two stories within one. And we also have the actors, the characters, which are related to events, related to one another, and related to time and space through events. In natural language processing, we have uh, different modes of discourse. Narration is one of them. And the four most common are narration, description, exposition, and argumentation. When we uh, look at a text, like a news text, for example, we usually have a mixture of these modes of discourse. In our work, we are mostly interested in narration, although in, in, in any uh, text, um, mainly in, in, uh, in fiction, for example, we also have description. Uh, we may also have exposition. And if we have dialogue, so we will have argumentation. But in, in, our, um, in our project, we are mostly looking at uh, news um, and other texts that uh, do not include typically uh, dialogues, for example, or opinions. They are more objective um, uh, texts that describe um, stories. So the overall task of um, uh, narrative extraction from text can be uh, seen as the identification in raw uh, textual sources of the structure that contains and relates events and characters along important dimensions such as time, space, intent, and effect. So we take um, a text and from this text, we want to devise this structure. So this structure has different parts and our overall task will be subdivided in, in different smaller uh, tasks that are then combined to obtain one such structure. So Another um, additional task is interpretation. Uh, it may be of interest to determine the profile of characters, for example, to know if a character has this um, or uh, that uh, characteristic, also the nature of the actions and the explanation for a particular sequence of events. So this is uh, at the semantic level and uh, we may also be interested in doing this kind of, of action. Uh, Another task is segmentation. So if we have a narrative and we extract the, ele the narrative elements from the text, we can then divide this uh, structure in parts depending on the type of narrative. Uh, for example, plays have uh, traditionally uh, five uh, parts, introduction, rise, climax, return, and resolution. So this is more the structure of tragedy. Uh, novels are divided in chapters and chapters contain scenes and sequels. So there are uh, already uh, well identified uh, segments and parts of narratives. News, for example, have lead and paragraphs and can contain other parts of, um, of uh, their structure. So other interesting tasks can be, for example, the narrative structure learning, narrative completion. So if we have a narrative uh, we can try to guess how it will 
continue what will happen to this particular character. So it's something similar to, to link prediction, for example, but in a more complex structure or narrative generation, which is something that uh, is very much along the line of text generation, which is a very hot topic in, in machine learning and in NLP uh, these days. Narrative completion is something that we do uh, quite often when we are reading and when we are um, uh, following a narrative uh, because we are always trying to guess what happens next and this is also part of the fun and part of the, of the enjoyment of, of uh, following a uh, narrative. So why narrative is extraction? So the motivations are basically um, very diverse. We can be uh, interested in having transparency and, and, and dissemination, for example, in, the, in uh, democracy in citizenship, it's important that people uh, get the um, important information and if uh, extracting narratives from text and re-representing these narratives in different ways, which are easier to, to uh, absorb, may be uh, useful for uh, news readers, for citizens that can see, for example, they can have a deeper view of a political decision making. In other areas like um, medicine and uh, journalism, uh, from the point of view of a journalist or finance and law, we can uh, use narrative extraction to have executive digests for professionals. For example, doctors can uh, see a timeline of a patient clinical record. Um, a clinical record can be relatively long with um, descriptions of uh, what happened in different um, um, appointments of the patient with different doctors and when a new doctor or a doctor sees uh, um, a patient again it is very useful to have this narrative account of their uh, patient so this is called a clinical narrative and we are currently involved in a project with the oncological hospital of porto uh, doing uh, this kind using this kind of approach um, and in art and, uh, and culture in general, this kind of, 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 of uh, effort is very interesting, useful for uh, analyzing uh, narratives, analyzing stories, uh, characterizing and comparing stories in different cultures, um, et cetera. So many different uh, possible applications that can be um, uh, useful. Um, the pipeline, the computational pipeline for, for this overall task, um, maybe defined in different ways. We see it as uh, these five steps. The first one is pre-processing. The second is the identification and extraction of narrative ele elements. The third is the information link is where we link these elements with each other. And then we uh, represent these, uh, these uh, elements uh, already linked, the structure that I mentioned a while ago. Uh, in different ways, for example, in a formal representation or in a timeline or a visual representation or some other form. And then um, he uh, can perform evaluation of the, of the whole result. So in terms of pre-processing, I will go through this uh, quite quickly. This is the usual stuff for natural language processing. We have the lexical analysis, the syntactic analysis and semantic analysis. So um, we have tasks like the um, sentence splitting, dividing the text in sentences, which at the first sight may seem like something trivial, but uh, has uh, some pitfalls, but it's something that is um, solved to a certain stage and there are good solutions that can be used. Uh, in terms of lexical tasks or tasks that, that um, look at words, we have the tokenization, which is a very important step. And this can be done with the pattern-based analysis or even with machine learning. Uh, we have um, also uh, recently new, new uh, approaches for tokenization, like the, the word word piece tokenizer, which can tokenize not only full words, but also subwords uh, when the word is, is not uh, previously known. Um, then we have cleaning and normalization steps to simplify the text. And this is more or less important depending on what we want to do with the text in the end, like removing stop words 
or a case normalization, stemming, lemmatization. And in general, for a narrative extraction, this kind of approaches will uh, give us, um, will uh, take away from the text uh, potentially uh, useful information. Um, in terms of syntactic tasks, we have the part of speech tagging, which uh, is also uh, a problem with uh, available solutions and uh, can basically is, is, is consists of assigning to each uh, word a tag of their uh, morphosyntactic category. So if it is a name or a verb or uh, an adverb. Um, we have parsing, which is dividing the the, the sentence in uh, different chunks, and there are different types of, of, um, of parsing. We have the, the chunking or shallow parsing and dependency parsing, which decomposes the sentence uh, into elements that depend on each other um, and already gives uh, a structure that is, um, is closer to, to the, the semantic uh, view of the, of the sentence. Then we have semantic tasks like co-reference resolution, where we, we have to um, identify the different words that refer to the same entity. For example, in this text, we have John the musician, and then there's his presentation. So this his is, is a reference to, to John. And this is a very um, challenging task uh, with some um, existing solutions. But um, but of course, we're still with, with many, many pitfalls. Um, then we have semantic rule labeling, a very important task for a narrative extraction because in semantic rule labeling, basically we um, uh, try to identify uh, in a sentence, the predicate or a predicate of the sentence. Like for example, here, John the musician pulled a rabbit out of a hat at the show in Edinburgh this year. So pulled is the predicate and we want to, to identify which are the arguments of this, um, of this uh, uh, predicate. Like for example, John the magician is the first argument, a rabbit is another argument, out of a hat is another argument at the show in Edinburgh. And, the, and the, we have a temporal um, uh, argument here this year for this uh, this predicate. So this is also a challenging task that uh, also has some uh, good solutions in, in English. Uh, for Portuguese, it's more complicated. We had recently um, a master thesis uh, doing semantic role labeling in Portuguese using uh, a BERT-based approach, uh, which obtained uh, good results, but uh, in Portuguese, we also have the limitation of having um, a shortage of um, annotated data, which is a challenge in general for whoever is working in, in, with Portuguese and, uh, and natural language uh, processing. So it is a, a, a challenging task and it is a very relevant task for um, narrative extraction because from here we can identify events, it can help to identify events and also the predicates, the arguments of these events and the relationship between events and entities, for example. Um, <clears throat> word sense disambiguation is also a, a challenging task. Um, in our group, Daniel Loredo is, is doing his PhD thesis in, in this area. Um, and, uh, and this can also be uh, quite important or although more subtle, it can be quite important to determine the true uh, sense of uh, a word, like for example, to play, John played against Mary. What is the meaning of, of this word? Does it mean playing in, as an instrument or playing as a sports or playing as, as in, a, in a, a kid's play? So uh, we can infer from here, for example, since it is against Mary that played here is probably in the sports sense, um, and this kind of, of inference can be done using, um, using machine learning um, with, with appropriate uh, annotated text. Again, the, the, doing this in Portuguese is more challenging than doing this in English due to the shortage of, uh, of um, um, corpora for, for Portuguese, annotated corpora. And then we have semantic enrichment, which can also be uh, important for 
narrative extraction, uh, for example, entity linking. So after identifying an entity, linking this entity with some ontology, some knowledge base. For example, in our project with, um, with Oncological Hospital, we uh, identify um, uh, procedures, and this is linked with uh, a code in UMLS, which is Unified Medical Language System. So it's, it's a standard developed by, um, by different um, entities. And we, um, we can uh, give an entity in a text a precise code that has a precise meaning. And with this, and this precise meaning can even be used in different languages. So it gives us a meaning that is um, um, independent of the original language that is, is used. But again, here we have also some difficulties with Portuguese, although UMLS also has resources in Portuguese, but typically not as, as rich as in, in English. Another interesting uh, approach is wikification. In wikification, we uh, can link entities with Wikipedia content concepts. So for example, we have, if we have this uh, sentence like Cristiano Ronaldo scored for Juventus and became the all times top scorer. So uh, we, we can process this sentence and look for links to Wikipedia. So it finds uh, the, the page for Cristiano Ronaldo and it finds the page for Juventus FC. So in, in this case, we have a semantic enrichment. So we, we, we can know more things about Juventus and about Cristiano Ronaldo, which, um, work like the common sense knowledge or knowledge base that is additional and can uh, help in understanding what's what is going on um, so in terms of the um, narrative uh, extraction so the next step is to identify and extract event, uh, events uh, entities um, and also um, time uh, references so there are different tasks uh, here that uh, um, can have to be addressed, like for example, detection and classification of events, the recognition and classification of entities, um, which is uh, the recognition of entities is, is uh, um, a very, uh, uh, very worked task with many different solutions, but still challenging in, in many different uh, ways. Um, extraction of temporal information, uh, and then some more um, complex tasks like understanding the duration of events and the linking, linking events with the temporal references. So this is uh, the topic of uh, one PhD thesis that is starting uh, in our group. This, uh, um, this task of linking uh, events with the temporal references, which allows us to then make the inference of, um, of uh, the temporal inference about events and to relate different events and to relate um, entities or characters to the events. So what is an event? Um, an event is something that is significant, uh, happening at a specific time and place and which has consequences. So we have here the, the different dimensions, the temporal, the, the, the location, the, and also the causal dimension. Um, in general, in an event, and uh, we have uh, questions about when did it happen, where did it happen, who, what, why, and how. So we have these, these um, uh, different um, questions that we, um, have to answer most of the time to understand what the event uh, carries. Um, events have um, a structure that, that has been defined, for example, in the in ACE, um, uh, in specifically as the event mention, where, which basic is basically the the sentence where the event is is. Uh, is mentioned. Then we have the event trigger that corresponds to the to the predicates that we saw in in uh, uh, semantic rule label, labeling and the event arguments. Again, the, the arguments that we saw in uh, semantic rule labeling, like John Edinburgh this year, and um, and the, the argument rule 
that uh, tells us which uh, uh, what uh, is doing each one of the of the arguments in the in the event structure. So um, we have again a number of different tasks for um, for events like event extraction. So basically identifying the events. Um, Detecting the arguments, so we, this can be approached with with semantic role labeling, for example. Um, trigger detection, so trying to to understand where is the what is the the, the, the specific word that is triggering the event, uh, and then there are other derived uh, tasks like, for example, first story detection. So if you have a, a set of uh, um, of documents, for example, in, in, a, in a set of, uh, of news articles, and you want to detect what is the first event, um, uh, that the first occurrence of, of something, and, uh, and then you may be interested in tracking these um, along these, these, uh, these series of documents. And you have to topic detection, topic tra tracking, um, and which again are very important for uh, identify, identifying topics in streams of news articles or, or processing a series of articles that talk about um, specific uh, subjects. So the approach is for event extraction and this stands, this is true for most of these tasks um, at these different levels. You, we have typically pattern-based and unsupervised tasks. So these pattern-based tasks are based on uh, regular expressions and uh, and other uh, cues that uh, help to identify in this case events but you can do this for identifying entities and and other and other uh, elements and then you can apply a machine learning um, approach with engineered features so we can say the traditional approach to to machine learning where you have to construct your own features and to, to fill in the features for each of these, of these um, cases. And then you have the neural based approaches where you take your uh, words in the text as embeddings and, um, and you can apply uh, neural models like convolutional neural networks or recurrent neural networks and other approaches to, to, uh, to, learn the representation for, for, for the problem. So for, for applying these machine learning approaches, you, you need data, you need annotated data. Um, so you need benchmarks uh, and uh, you, you can find uh, for many of these tasks, challenge data that can be used for, um, for uh, training models in, in many of these uh, tasks. So um, typically they have to be specifically annotated, which is a very um, expensive process. Um, although you can also use some uh, weak supervision and in some tasks you can also use some self supervision, although not in these more uh, structured tasks, which is uh, harder to, to, to do it in a self supervised way. So typically there is, um, uh, a, a big effort in, in annotating and in building data sets, which is a, um, a limitation for, for this uh, kind of problem. Um, but fortunately for many of these tasks, you, we, you, we already, already have uh, some data sets available. Again, more typically in English and often uh, not uh, so much in Portuguese, although we, we have uh, some data sets in Portuguese also for, for many of these tasks. So there are other uh, event related tasks um, like event classification, event relevance characterization. So you define, you, you identify all the events and you want to see which one is the, is the important one or how important is each one of the events. So this is important, for example, for summarization sub-event detection, event hierarchy construction, etc. So an important dimension is time. And there are many tasks related to time. For example, temporal tagging is the identification of temporal references in, in the text. Um, the temporal relevance is, uh, is measuring the importance of these temporal relevance uh, references uh, to the event or to the text. Um, and this is something that we also have been working on, in particular, 
Ricardo Campos in his PhD uh, thesis and uh, also uh, more recently with, with other works and is related again with the, with the, the PhD uh, thesis of Hugo Souza that I mentioned uh, a while ago about relating events and time references. Um, document dating is sometimes an important uh, problem when, when, when documents do not have um, a timestamp. And then temporal inference includes uh, a number of tasks, but typically is, is the problem of determining temporal relations of events from implicit cues. So to know if a, an event happens before the other at the same time or is included in the other, etc. So um, this is an example of uh, the Time Matters demo, which is a uh, work led by uh, Ricardo Campos and as a result of his uh, PhD thesis. Um, and here uh, you can see that in the text, some uh, temporal expressions have been identified. So this can be done automatically. And then you can um, use these uh, temporal expressions um, and, and try to determine the relevance of each of these temporal expressions in your text or in a, a set of texts. And this again can be done in, in different ways. So the, the next step is to link the narrative elements. So we have the, the time references, we have the events, we have the entities, um, and we need to um, link these, these uh, these uh, elements uh, linking, for example, events to time references, linking entities to events, and also finding relations between entities, times, and places. So this is the, the third step of the pipeline, the information linking. And again, um, we, uh, we have a number of tasks here. Um, and, and this is related to temporal reasoning. So we went to, to um, uh, to characterize, for example, the, the evolution of an event uh, over time as a whole. Um, and, uh, and this is also related to temporal information extraction, which is a, um, almost a classical uh, information extraction uh, subfield, which is basically information extraction with, with time text. Um, so here we have an example of, of uh, um, of temporal reason. So you, you, you start with the text and you identify the important elements uh, like the, the, the temporal references and the, the, the events. So here you have the show XYZ contest last one presented. So these are events and you have this temporal information. You, you uh, want to find links between the temporal information and the, the events. And from, from this you can can uh, determine if this event is simultaneous, for example, with this one, um, or uh, it could be even the, the same. So this would be a co-reference. And from this uh, linked uh, elements, you can, for example, represent this as a timeline as you, as you see here. So um, some of these things are um, uh, inferences, so they, which means obviously that they can they have a certain level of uncertainty and, uh, um, and they, they, they become one interpretation of what is in the text. So um, there are different approaches. I will not go into detail here of how to learn uh, temporal relations between events, for example, um, and here one, one into interesting thing is, is to, uh, for example, if you, if you have a text, you can assume that the events are in the text in a, in a temporal order. So if you have text with this characteristic, this, this gives you uh, an easy labeling of, of, the, of the texts for, um, for training uh, the, the, the determination of uh, temporal relation with, between events. And, and there are also approaches where you you can extract events and temporal links jointly so that you can uh, learn better um, and with less errors the, the models for determining the, the temporal relation between events. So the alternative is to have a pipeline where you first extract these elements and then you, um, you use the elements extracted in the first level to determine the, the, the second one. 
So here is an example of uh, one annotated text with, with um, events, uh, for example. So this is, is not uh, easy to read. So basically it says, Netherlands, the world court, uh, Friday rejected uh, US and British objections to a, a Libyan world court the case that has, etc. So here this, this um, a labeling um, identifies entities, for example, here you have organization, but also identifies events and, and time references like this one here. Okay, so this is Friday, this is a time reference. So this kind of, um, of uh, standard notation is, is the one that we can find in, in benchmark uh, data sets and can be used for training uh, models. And um, this can be, uh, this annotation can be summarized uh, like this. So, uh, and for each of the documents, you, you have, uh, for example, a temporal reference here. Um, and here you have relations like after and uh, uh, vague or uh, included, is included. And these are the labels that you use for your, um, for your machine learning model. And then you, you can basically apply a classification approach to, to classify each of these um, pairs as, as uh, one of these uh, classes. Okay, so you 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 have this uh, uh, style of annotation, which is um, standard, and you can of course add new uh, relations if necessary. But these are benchmarks that can uh, be readily used for training uh, models uh, uh, for for event relation, uh, temporal relation of events. So there are different approaches uh, using deep neural net, deep neural models. As I said, almost all these problems can be approached using a pattern-based, unsupervised approach, uh, more traditional machine learning approach with featured uh, uh, with um, engineered features and also uh, uh, neural models that are. Um, strongly based on representation learning that do not require um, engineered features uh, as, as uh, the previous ones. So uh, this is one example of, of, um, of an approach for learning uh, temporal relations with this kind of data using deep neural uh, models and uh, BERT embeddings. Um, and also uh, these authors propose dense annotations. You have, you have um, uh, data sets which, which are not densely annotated. So uh, only some of the events are annotated. And these authors also propose um, uh, a tool for densely annotating these, uh, this kind of uh, corpora, which as I said, is, is usually very um, uh, time consuming and is, is a bottleneck for, for many of these tasks. Then, um, in terms of entity and event linking, again, this, these are um, uh, for, for linking, e linking events and entities, you can use semantic rule labeling. And for uh, linking entities with external data, you can use the, the wikification, for example, that I mentioned before, or medical data databases uh, like UMLS that I mentioned before, and other databases. So I'm, uh, I will try to to wrap up, um, this is just a picture of uh, uh, entity linking. Um, you can, uh, again, extract relations uh, between entities uh, using um, a semantic role labeling or using a more, a simpler approach, which, which is to identify binary relations. And again, you have a number of, of data sets for binary relations with the so-called triplets where you have two um, elements of the relation and the relation and um, and the NRA relations are um, typically dealt with with um, uh, semantic role uh, labeling. So uh, for the fourth step, uh, the representation of narratives, uh, one thing that we're trying to do in our uh, project, in our approach is to um, represent the extracted elements of the narrative as a formal language, and then use this formal language to represent the narrative in other languages, like for example, timelines or, 
or graphs or um, other uh, approaches. So uh, the, the formalism that we are using is uh, uh, discourse representation structures from the discourse representation theory, which is basically a, uh, a first order logic representation. And there is another approach, which is the abstract meaning representation that we are currently using DRT. So DRT looks a bit like this. So you have a, a, a very simple example. Here, a man walked down the street, he whistled, and you have basically uh, a, a first order logic representation of this. Um, and this is something that is used by uh, the linguists and um, is, is an established formalism for linguists, which um, combines quite well with, with the com computational approach uh, for for uh, narrative extraction, and we are um, we are currently using this formalism to represent the extracted elements, so that with this kind of formalism we can represent the, the narrative in a, uh, a different way. So, um, although the the trend these days is to use uh, vector approaches, formal languages, I believe, still have an important word to say, and the two things can be combined. So representing the, uh, a narrative with formal languages has the advantage of being readable and also of giving structure that the vectorial uh, approach doesn't easily give. Um, of course, it has some disadvantages that uh, may be um, worked uh, combining um, uh, embedding types approach with with uh, with uh, this kind of formal uh, representation. So other types of representation, which I called here displaying ways of displaying narratives, um, are more graphical typically. Although the formal representation is a way of representation the, the of representing the narrative, we um, we try to uh, obtain these other representations for from uh, the the basic formal representation of the narrative. And we have things like timelines, infographics, we can even use cartoons or a slideshow. So uh, currently we are working on uh, representation like this. For example, this is a message sequence chart where you have the, the uh, actors here in, the, in, the, in these boxes, and then you have a timeline going from top to bottom and you have relations between the actors um, in this way. So this is a very, a very synthetic way of uh, uh, representing a narrative, not very, um, not very friendly for uh, generic users, but it's something that is being useful now, especially for us for, for detecting problems in annotation and, and also for, for uh, checking uh, the results of um, automatic um, extraction. So other, um, friendlier uh, approaches are the use of, of graphs. So this is the same text, but represented as a graph. So here you have, uh, you, can, you can visualize uh, the, the entities, uh, which uh, for example, this entity has uh, three different names because it occurs in the text with, different, with three different denominations and you have the relations here. So basically the same information, but displayed in the, in a different way. Then you have timelines, which are, are very uh, useful for um, narratives and what we call proto-narratives. So uh, uh, learning, um, obtaining uh, the events, uh, but not in a very precise way. So you have an idea of, of what happened and when it happened, but uh, still not in a very uh, refined way. And this is an example of our uh, application, Quantum Historias, where we uh, can give a query. And from this query, uh, a number of uh, news are retrieved. And from this set of news, we, we uh, identify important time points. And uh, this timeline represents the, the number of news that uh, are identified at each moment. And these red bars, represent uh, splits in, in time intervals that were automatically determined. And for each of these splits, we make a summary of what happened in, in this particular interval. And so this can be used for, uh, it's, it's a very high level approach. It can be used for any query. Um, and this was, was developed on, on the 
Archivo uh, Ponte Pt, the Portuguese web, web archive, where they have um, an archive of uh, uh, Portuguese websites. So in time matters, we also have a, um, a different representation where you, you, you have a time and you, you can um, you, you can try to associate. So in this case, we, uh, we are trying to associate a picture with, uh, with what is being uh, said. And the picture is also being automatically retrieved from, from the, um, uh, the web archive. So sometimes this gives some spectacular uh, errors, but uh, it's something that has to be defined, uh, refined, and is of, of course something that is, is, can be very sensitive and uh, we have to be careful with that. And this is an example from a different group, from the group of uh, Georgiana Ifrim, where they represent sets of news on, uh, on a particular topic. In this case, it's impeachment. And you see references to different impeachments in different countries. And you have the timeline and you have the importance and also the hashtags you find in Twitter for <clears throat> this kind of, um, for this topic in particular. <clears throat> um, this is a completely different example. This is not extracted from text, but it's it's a nice example for what we uh, can try to do with text as well. <clears throat> of course, we need more than text for this, but this is a, a, a comics that is extracted from a video. So this is done by a, a Polish um, company, which is called Comixify. Actually, you can try the demo online. And, um, and the, the Tomasz from Comixify gave an, inv an invited talk in our AI for Narratives workshop in, at each guy. Um, and basically what they do is they analyze a video and, they, and, and automatically they identify important events in the video. And they can even try to um, extract um, um, sentences to put in, in, these, um, in these balloons. And, um, and, uh, and at the same time, they, they gave, make an artistic uh, transformation of, of the video so that it looks like a comic. So this is something that is, is different from what, what we are doing, but it's also a nice example of uh, narrative extraction of transforming one original means, in this case, video uh, into a comics uh, with a, a, a different uh, graphical language. <clears throat> So finally, um, evaluation, it's, it's uh, uh, as you can imagine, very challenging to uh, evaluate this whole uh, task. All these um, uh, tasks, uh, the subtasks, the, the lower level tasks can be uh, evaluated per se with, with the data sets. The evaluation of the, of the whole stack uh, is, is more complicated uh, and um, uh, the final step will always uh, to have human judges to to uh, if, to uh, assess the result of of the story and some indirect uh, uh, tasks like for example question answering uh, can be used to, to to evaluate the final result of the narrative extraction stack so currently we are not uh, at this uh, level we are gathering and annotating news, which we are starting with some representation. Um, we are also, uh, we are using uh, journalistic news and also tweets as, as uh, input text. Uh, we have worked with tasks like keyword extraction, event identification, temporal linking of events, um, also using the DRS as an internal uh, representation formalism. We have some demos. And uh, we are um, building the pieces to, to fill, fill up the, the pipeline uh, from, uh, uh, from bottom to top. Um, we are also working in different uh, visualization uh, uh, means like timelines and message sequence charts, graphs, and also icons. We have a, a master's. Uh, um, dissertation on transforming text to icons. And uh, we, we, we have some software available, uh, demos, and uh, we are building also uh, a package uh, for uh, the whole pipeline of uh, narrative extraction, which we 
uh, hope to have available at least at the end of the project, which is now at more or less at the end of first year and it still has two more, more years to go. Um, so there are many challenges uh, with this. Uh, Portuguese is a challenge. So many things, as I said, are ready for English, not so much for Portuguese. Um, annotation is, is, is quite challenging. Self-learning is, is, uh, is a way to, to go, but it's not always easy to find a self-learning avenue for, for these tasks. Validation is also challenging and other more advanced semantic uh, approaches like language grounding. And um, of course, in the, on the visualization side, uh, the visualization of narratives, uh, for example, building a, a comic or build, building a, a slideshow uh, with graphics can be uh, challenging because then you have to, to obtain uh, images, not only from the text, but also from other uh, sources. So many different things to do. Um, you have some pointers here. I will um, uh, make the, the slides available um, so that you can try some of these things and give us your ideas, your suggestions. And, um, and that's it. And I think I've talked for too long, sorry. <laughs>